we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that we have been endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You'll recognize that as the beginning of the second movement of our U.S. Declaration of Independence, signed July 4, 1776, authored by Thomas Jefferson. What a wonderful thought that we've been given by our creator rights, can't be taken away with them, uh, taken, can't be taken away from us. Life, that's from God. Liberty, that's from God. And he says the pursuit of happiness. Why wouldn't he just say happiness? Well, somehow this deist, Thomas Jefferson, wasn't a Trinitarian, didn't believe in the triune God, but had some sense of divinity. And he understood the notion that many of us have learned over the a span of our life that happiness doesn't just happen. We, we got to go get it. Today we're talking about happiness. Who doesn't want to sit through a message on happiness? Um, happiness... If it's possible and so desired, why is it so hard for many of us to find? If happiness is possible and so desired, why do so few find it? We've seen around us people who would have everything the world would say that we need to have happiness, and they have it in abundance. They lack nothing, and yet they find themselves incredibly miserable, unhappy, some even suicidal. Pastor Zardi kind of touched on that sentiment last week as he talked about how much is too much. So if happiness is possible and so desired, why do so few find it? Simple biblical answer is because we're looking for it in the wrong place. We have been deceived by the master of lies to chase things, worldly things, shiny, attractive, new, fast, better, but only lead to despair. Christian author C.S. Lewis writes, oh, that's the declaration of, uh, that's the, uh, Uh, Yeah, independence, talked about this a second ago. C.S. Lewis writes, human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. So here we are in this book of Ecclesiastes. It's it's an interesting book. If you've read through it, it's challenging. There seem to be words in the book of Ecclesiastes that you, you don't think would be in the Bible. Like we have words on the screen through the series. I'm like, wow, that's in the Bible. Remember this in this series. It's really important to have perspective on what this book is. It's a book written by Solomon, a man who the Bible said had everything. He tried everything the world has to offer to find happiness, to f- find fulfillment. Money, women, power, uh, prestige, all the things that we all want. He had it all of it and tried it and found it disappointing. He uses words like frustrating, and this is all futile. He uses the word vanity a lot. That means worthless. He uses the phrase of chasing after the wind. In other words, it it has no value at all. I tried this stuff, and none of it brings me fulfillment. So today's text is no exception. Um, You had pastors already read it at the beginning. This is from the sixth chapter, and this is Solomon writing about the fact that people are given things, but it seems like God doesn't give them the ability to find happiness in them, to enjoy them. He writes, I have seen Another evil under the sun, and that under the sun phrase is important to understand in Ecclesiastes. Anytime you see that, that's Solomon referring to life away from God, under the the natural order of things, the sinful, broken world. There's another evil in the broken, sinful world, we could say, and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor so they lack nothing in their hearts, but God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, to find happiness in them. And strangers enjoy them instead. This too is meaningless, a grievous evil. This is God's word for us this morning. It's my prayer that he would help us understand it. Let's come together in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this book, Ecclesiastes. It's challenging, it's surprising. Sometimes it's confounding. Thank you that we know it's a review of the frustrations that come from trying to find satisfaction apart from you. So draw us to you this morning, Father, through your word, later in the holy meal. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. For the glory of your son, Jesus, and in his name we pray, and together we all say, amen. Three sections to the message this morning. First, we're going to spend a little bit of time contrasting joy and happiness. They're different. The word joy, at least in our English translations, appears about 208 times in the Bible, joy. The word happiness appears about eight It's not that God doesn't want us to have happiness, but he wants us to understand a much deeper concept of joy, and then we can understand happiness too, and and that's our task today is to understand happiness. Secondly, we'll find out where in the New Testament it, it leads us to sadness, like what will lead us to sadness, and that's important for us to understand as we're trying to find things to avoid to find happiness. And then we'll spend the third portion uh, really understanding what the Bible says about finding happiness. So this idea of a difference between joy and happiness, the, the first is to define joy this way. It's an unshakable position 
as a result of security in God. It's unshakable. It's where we stand. We can't be moved off of it. It's not a reaction. It's not emotion. We stand in joy. Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? Galatians 5, fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. It's the second one, love, joy. It's planted in us. It's a fruit. It grows. Maybe some of you have a little baby fruit of joy, and it's growing as your Christian maturity increases and you grow in the faith. It'll get stronger. You'll have a deeper sense of joy. When we have a right relationship with God, we know that when even unhappy things come into our life, we can still have a position of joy. You can be unhappy but still joyful, and I've experienced that in my life. When the circumstances of life bring unhappiness, you still can have a position of joy. I'm going to show you a psalm where the psalm writer writes that people around him have an abundance of stuff, but he, in his... um, not abundance of stuff, still has joy. In 4.7 he writes, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. You, God, it's from you, you did it, you put it, and it's joy. And I have more than the people around me. They've got grain and wine and all kinds of stuff, but I have joy because it comes from you. It doesn't matter that I don't have that much. My position is joy. Another place in the book of Psalms, 16th chapter, verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is a fullness of joy. In your presence, joy comes, God, not from things of the earth, not from blessings, although those are fine. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I've used this illustration before, the idea that joy is like a train platform. You're at a train station, you're on the platform. A train comes in, it can't move you off your platform. You are on a platform of joy. A train can come into your life bringing unhappy things, and you react and you're unhappy, but you still have a much deeper, a firmer foundation. Joy, much deeper, much different than happiness. You can't be moved. Back to the book of Psalms, the 43rd Psalm. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Joy comes from being with God. All right, so that's a little bit on joy. Let's think about what happiness means, since that's our task this morning, to find happiness. Happiness is a result of circumstances. It's a little bit less deep than joy, we could say, because it, it kind of comes and goes depend, depending on what comes your way. One way to remember what happiness is is to say happiness depends on happenings. When an unhappy thing comes into my life, I'm unhappy. When a happy thing comes into my life, I'm happy. And we can think about it in two ways this morning, the things we can control that bring happiness or unhappiness and the things we can't control. And things we can control, like who you marry, The way you treat your body, your health, nutrition, sleep, exercise, the things you do to yourself. The way you treat others, who you vote for, your vocation, the things you do with your time, your pursuits, how you think about discipline. These are all things you can control, and if you do them in a wise, godly manner, for the most part, they bring happiness. If you go the other way, for the most part, they bring unhappiness. Then there are things we can't control, health issues that have nothing to do with the way we've chosen to treat our bodies. Maybe the death of a loved one. Can't control that. Political upheaval and war, natural disasters. These are all things that can come into our life that take our happiness away. So we'll leave that second one by itself there for, for the time being, the, the fact that there are things we can't control. And let's focus on the things we can control, the things we can look for. So let's go to the scriptures and find where we find sadness. What have people done that have brought them sadness? And we find this, that first of all, sadness is a prioritizing, or if you're taking notes, maybe write the word treasuring, a prioritizing or a treasuring of things more important than God, above God. The Bible also calls that idolatry. When you make things in the world, the blessings that he gives you, many of them good, higher than God, you will find unhappiness. We find this in this very familiar parable. In Matthew 10, starting in the 17th verse, Jesus started on his way and a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will find treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. The man was dismayed at this statement and he went away saddened because he had many possessions. So what's the true cause of this man's sadness? Is it that he had many possessions? No, it's that he prioritized them. He valued them. He treasured them higher than even walking with God. 
So when the challenge was laid before him by Jesus, second person of the Trinity, God himself, he was saddened because he was holding on so tightly to these things. Prioritizing, treasuring things above God will lead to sadness. Our family's really enjoying the Olympics. Uh, a lot of that is really fun for us to watch. I found this story not about the summer games, but about the winter ga- games. Um, Chloe Kim made history in being the youngest woman to win a gold medal in snowboarding in 2018. But she threw her gold medal in the trash and she said she hated life after she won it. Now, you read the stories, eventually she went back in the trash and got it back out. But the spirit of the article is that she thought this was it. And many of us do too. I mean, it's awesome. I would have loved to have been a gold medal winner. Who wouldn't love that? But she thought that was the ultimate. That would bring joy and happiness and she found it lacking. A similar article, why Olympic gold medalists get depressed. Can you imagine? Like you just won a gold medal because they thought it would fulfill them. They thought it was the all in all, and they found it lacking. When we prioritize things as being more important than God, it brings unhappiness. Funny story, uh, probably not true. Uh, The 12-year-old girl at the elementary school brought her mom's lipstick in, and and the girls are around her in the ladies' room, and she puts on the lipstick, and they all ooh and ah, and she goes up to the mirror, and and she lays a big kiss on the mirror, so her lips are right on there. And they, that, that makes them all very happy. So they all go on their way. They come back the next morning. It's been w- w- wiped off. Uh, the cleaning crew wiped it off. But now all of them had their mom's lipstick. So all 24 girls put on lipstick, and, and they lay a big kiss. So there's 24 lip marks on the mirror. And uh, the administration gets a hold of this because it's a problem for the cleaning crew every night. So the next morning, the principal meets those 24 12-year-old girls in the ladies' room with those 12, with the 24 lip marks still on the mirror. And she says, ladies, this has to stop. This is way too hard to clean up. If you've ever tried to clean up lipstick, you know how hard it is. And the cleaning man is there with them. And she said, it has to stop. I know it brings you happiness, but you got to stop doing it. In order to show you how hard it is to clean, I've got the cleaning guy here with me, and he's going to show you how he cleans these off every night. And she said, go ahead. And the cleaning guy is there with his big squeegee and he goes over to the toilet and (laughs) dips in the water and and cleans off those lipstick marks. (laughs) Trying to find happiness in things other than God is like kissing a toilet water washed mirror. (laughs) That's a sentence you didn't think you'd hear this morning. You think it'd be fun, but it's, it's not. It's gross, right? I mean, I've tried that. Have you tried that? I've tried it. It, it doesn't fulfill. Christian uh, pastor uh, John Piper, sin gets its power by persuading me to believe that I will be happier if I follow it. The power of all temptation is the prospect that it will make me happier. So first of all, from the New Testament, we find that sadness comes when we prioritize or treasure things above God. Secondly, having a misunderstanding of who Jesus is. We'll find uh, sadness when we don't know that he is God, that he's Savior, that he's the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. John 24, Jesus has already died, he's been resurrected, and he meets some of his followers walking on a road, but they don't recognize him. And we pick up the story in verse 17. And he said to them, what is this conversation you're holding as, as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. So why are these fellows sad? Well, if you read it in context, you know that they don't know who Jesus is. They thought he was going to be kind of a political conqueror, that he would win political power and drive the oppressive Roman uh, uh, people out of their land, uh, the occupiers, and he didn't do that. So they're sad. They didn't know that, as Jesus' cousin said, John the baptizer, behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Now, we as Christians know that. We've been redeemed. We know that he's not just a political person or a guy that told good parables or the healer of the sick. He's all those things, but he's much more. We have a clear biblical understanding that he's God, and his main purpose was to take away our sins. And he came, as we know, how the story goes from the Bible, and lived among us and died. He died on a cross. He became my sin. He became your sin. It seems almost vulgar to say, but I heard it this week, and I kind of like it, so I'll share it with you. When we look at Jesus on the cross, we see a big packet of sin. That makes us uncomfortable, but it's true. Jesus became a big packet of sin. That's what's remarkable about the God. And he did it for me, and he did it for you, and we have that understanding. And he did it so he could pay for our sins. 
He was born under the law too, like we all have been, under God's standard. You've got to live like this to be in my kingdom. We have all failed because of sin. He's the one and only guy who did it. And he said, you can have that grade that I earned in my life too. You simply believe. Through faith, the Bible says, it's a gift. It's grace. It's the center of who we are as Christians, understanding that. One way to think about the gospel, and I heard this phrase this week, and I always try to come up with ways to keep it fresh, to make you understand, it's a transfer of trust. Before redemption, I was trusting myself. I can do it. I'll be good enough. God will like me. I'll find my own happiness. But now, as a redeemed person, it's a transfer of trust. Now I'm trusting Christ to be my redemption, to be my goodness before God the Father, to find me happiness, to to bring me happiness. And since we're talking about happiness, a quick detour in happiness, um, kind of away from the points and where we're going, if you have Christ in you, God is very happy with you. That's important for some of us to hear. I need to hear that. Sometimes I think he's just mad at me and disappointed. I messed up again, rebelled, angry, greedy, gluttonous, whatever. He, He must just be so sad with me. He's not because he sees Jesus in you. As we know from Luke 15, those wonderful parables, specifically the one about the lost son and the lost sheep, the father and the shepherd respectively, return with great joy because that which was lost was found and they're so happy they throw a party. God the Father is so happy with you. So let's spend a little time here near the third portion of our message, understanding where we find happiness. Really long point, I know, much longer than you're supposed to make them, but I really want us to grasp this. When you pursue what the world says will make you happy, you will not find it. This is basically the whole book of Ecclesiastes. Happiness is found how, how, here's our point, walk with God and live in his wisdom. Walking with God is impossible unless we have Christ, right? He brings us into a walk with God. Happiness, joy, good. But how do I find continued happiness? We open his book and we live in his wisdom. How is it now that we should live? And we spend a lot of time around here talking about that. Another way to think about this is to do life with God, accept his forgiveness, follow his statutes, seek forgiveness, Confess your failures. Find happiness. The old church fathers used to say, if you pursue happiness and not righteousness, you'll find neither. If you pursue happiness but not righteousness, you find neither. But if you pursue righteousness, a rightness with God, and not necessarily happiness, you will find both. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself. Be happy in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Happiness is found when we live with God in his righteousness and walk in his wisdom. And let's not think like this is second best. Like we tried the stuff the world says is fun. I tried the parties and the girls and the beer and that, I, that led me to unhappiness. So now I, I guess I got to go with God. Like let's not treat it second best option, right? Because the Bible is clear. And for those of you that have experienced him, and we're getting a little mysterious here, in a time of worship, and he's pressed down on you, You've been reading his word and you find how marvelous he is. There's been a miraculous healing in your life. You found peace somehow in the middle of despair. When the world says you should be undone, you found peace. You've discovered that he's not second best. We don't kind of head down, kick in the dirt. I guess I got to go with God. The other stuff didn't work. The Bible describes him as glorious and full of majesty. And beautiful. His grandeur, his splendor, his superbness. In this we find happiness, not second best. It's what's best for us. Some of us pastors are reading a book called You're Not Crazy. And the authors say this, and the first couple parts get your attention. The deepest reason for all our personal problems and all the evils of of history. Hold on a minute. These guys are claiming to know the problem of all the world and all the evils. And then they, they declare, here it is, that we don't know how beautiful God is. And I believe that's true. I think if humanity would see how beautiful he is, how marvelous, how glorious, his splendor and his grandeur, we'd put away the things we're chasing in this world and walk with him and his guidance and know happiness. Psalm 48, my God, I am happy to do whatever you want. I never stop thinking about your word, about your teachings. Martin Luther was miserable. 
He was a German Augustinian monk, 16th century, smart guy, knew the Bible better than you and me. He knew that he was a sinner. He was keenly aware of the wrath of God and what he was facing and how horrible his eternity would be. All of that's true, but what he had was a misguided understanding of how to escape from that. He would starve himself. Maybe that'll make me holy. He would spend hours literally in the confession booth confessing everything he could think of, wearing out the priest who was hearing his confession. He would whip himself. He would purposely wear itchy tunics to torture his body. Certainly all of this will make me holy. It just made him unhappy. And then he was rooting the truth of God's word. And he finally understood the good news, the happy news that Jesus gives us complete forgiveness of our sins and righteousness, the gospel. And across the English Channel at about the same time, one of his contemporaries, William Tyndale, in England was writing a book called um, Pathway to Holy Scripture. And Tyndale says this, and look at all the happy language in here. Evangelion, which we call the gospel, is a Greek word. It signifies good, merry, glad, and joyful tidings that make a, a man's heart glad. You make him sing, dance, and leap for joy. Christ, before his death, commanded and appointed that such evangelion, gospel or tidings, happiness, should be declared throughout the world. So happiness comes from an understanding that God is with us, he is for us. We gladly walk with him through our faith in Jesus. And now Acts, to the New Testament, Acts 2.28. You have shown me the paths of life. In your presence, you will fill me with happiness. It comes from Christ. Um, One of the ways that we're excited around here to share Christian living, we know the gospel, we're saved by faith, nothing we can do, but now how should we live is by getting all of us back in the word. And Pastor um, Zardi talked about it briefly. We're so excited. We're calling it ABC, adult Bible classes. These will happen on Sunday mornings, kind of in the middle of this service. service. I get it. There was just nowhere else to put it. We weren't going to move services. So the hope is that you sign up for these, Attend them, and then attend if you're a contemporary worship person, I guess you are. Come to the 11 o'clock service. Those things will line up. Pray about it. I, I get it if, if it's not going to work out, but pray about it. Five excellent classes, excellent teachers, all the information to the right as you walk into the commons. Pick up a half sheet with all the descriptors. Sign up so we know that you're coming. You can do it online too. It's our prayer that we'll fill these classes and all have a better understanding of God's word in our life. Got to turn the corner here. We're out of time. Next steps, these are at the bottom of your worship outline. Confess and repent of any idols you've allowed to steal your happiness, like the rich young ruler, right? If there's things in your life that you think are more important to God, give that stuff to God. It's idolatry. It'll only bring unhappiness. Secondly, find happiness by determining to walk with God and live in his wisdom. God, you saved me. I walk with you. Now give me wisdom. What decisions should I make? How can I choose happy things in my life? And number three, and I want to emphasize, celebrate, really celebrate happiness that comes from a life with our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your word teaches that all who take refuge in you are glad. Let them sing forever. Your word says, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Your word says, may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say the Lord is great. You are a God of happiness. You are a God of joy. Thank you that unshakable joy comes from our position in you and that happiness comes as a result of walking with you and benefiting from your your wisdom, guidance, and direction. Bless your church today here at the corner of Abbey and 82 and the church around the world. We pray this in Jesus' name and together we all say, amen. Thanks for taking the time to learn a little bit more about Royal Redeemer. We want you to be a part of our Royal Redeemer family here. May God richly bless you and guide you, and I truly look forward to seeing you soon.